Are we back? <laughs> hey guys, we're gonna try that one one more time. Um, not 100% sure what happened there. I feel like there was StreamYard did something very uh, unsettling with my devices there for, for for just a second. We're gonna take that one more time. Give me just a moment. Uh, All right, let me know if you can hear that now. Guys, do me a favor, let me know in the comments if the audio is coming through, okay? I'm gonna play some guitar too, make sure that's working. How are you doing? Let's try that again. Nick Jennison, from Guitar Interactive Magazine at GI Plus. It's Monday. We're doing the thing that we do on Mondays, which is hang out and talk about the guitar. We are back in our acoustic guitars in this lesson brought to you by our friends at Elixir. And uh, no surprise, we've got a set of fresh Elixir strings on this guitar, which is why it sounds so nice uh, and why it plays so nice too. Took an opportunity to uh, go down a string gauge compared to the last time we played. So I've got 11s on this guitar. Turns out it was 12s that were on prior. Gone down to 11s and they feel and sound absolutely fabulous. We'll talk a little more about that as we go on, but uh, hopefully everything is coming through loud and clear uh, and we are now free of audio issues. Uh, fingers crossed, hopefully anyway. So a little word about what we're doing today. Today, we're gonna to be discussing um, well, it's been described as easy chord substitutions, but what you might think about it as, rather than easy chord substitutions, it is that, but it's ways that you can take both chord progressions and your improvisations as a soloist and use ideas like chord substitution to make them sound more interesting without throwing the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. Is that entirely an English saying or is that something that has made it to the rest of the world? Let me know in the comments. Uh, anyway, so we'll talk about that in just a minute, but before we do, a little bit of housekeeping. First of all, a couple of ways that you can help us keep the lights on uh, and help us uh, make sure the audio works. You can do the following. You can give us a thumbs up on whatever platform you're watching on. That really does help. So if you're watching on Facebook, the heart icon is the favorite. Uh, second only to the angry icon for some reason. Please don't push the angry icon, but if you're gonna hit anything, heart or angry would be good. <laughs> Thumbs up on YouTube, the like would be great. Comments are even better than likes. Saves and shares, even better again. Uh, so, you know, you wanna help us get this out to as many guitar players as possible because this is free and we like giving you free stuff. You can share this with your guitar playing friends. You can also go to this URL down here, which is guitarinteractivemagazine.com forward slash GI hyphen plus, where you can sign up for GI plus and get exclusive lessons from the likes of Andy Wood, uh, Andy James, Tom Quayle, Rick Graham, myself, Michael Caswell, Giorgio Searchy, Sam Bell. Um, the list goes on Ian Simo, uh, 
who else do we have? Just, just endless. So many, so many, so many lessons. Um, and, you know, there are more in the can. There's more to come. So anyway, listen, we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Just a quick reminder as well, by the way, our friends from Elixir, Oh, how can I do this without confusing my little hands and my little brain? This way, there it is. Look at that. That's the Elixir logo. Um, <laughs> our friends from Elixir are sponsoring this stream. So they've been kind of not just to send me some strings, because, you know, maybe they heard us last week and went... That guy needs fresh strings. And they were right. Um, but, you know, they also like bringing you some lessons too. So there you go. Some lessons for you guys from our friends at Elixir. You can check out their social media links in the uh, the comments and also in the description, depending upon which platform you're watching us on. So before we get stuck in, let's do a little bit of a check-in with our friends in the stream and see how everybody's getting on. Uh, we've got some discussion of gear. We've got some discussion of injury, uh, all manner of stuff, physical health, etc., etc. Don't forget by the way if you have questions you can ask questions at any point in this stream and i'll either get to them right away or if it's not appropriate for what we're talking about at that very minute i will save them and i'll put them in our q a which is coming at the end of today's session so we've got q a at the end of the session so if you've got questions drop them down below let's see who's in marcin is of course first in uh at something ludicrous like five and a bit hours early uh i think the notification went out a little early today and marcin was like literally the first in the door once again with all of those uh mighty horns of rock um so yeah we're talking about strings and things we'll get to that in a second uh timothy appling is in the house uh timothy it is great to see you along with all of the early crowd pj is here too uh timothy appling did you get the modeler we're discussing some modelers last week ah yeah that's a really good question timothy so um last week we discussed uh modeler preferences you know the the difference between head rush uh quad cortex um what else helix um there are definitely others um just played a really interesting one this week week uh from mod devices called the mod dwarf which strikes me as a a, a modeler for somebody who's not even a modeler really it's a plug-in host um and it's it's for somebody who's a lot cleverer than me um let's put it that way it was a very cool device you can do all sorts of crazy stuff with it so that might be an option if you're kind of a a very very savvy type um maybe the kind of person that runs linux on their um their machine uh, as opposed to me on a mac who needs things made easy for himself uh but anyway yeah so timothy says uh not yet still deciding which one i want my guitar equipment desires change weekly i've been playing my old 11 rack a lot more this week uh and deciding and researching i will say that there's absolutely nothing wrong with the sound of an 11 rack and if you like it just because it's a little bit older doesn't mean it's bad you know um you'd be astonished at how good some of the old modeling gear sounds if you just dial it right and maybe consider changing out the um the speaker simulations so uh maybe loading irs on a separate piece of hardware maybe looped into the effects loop if your 11 rack has one that might be a good shout uh generally speaking the speaker sims are what let these old devices down if you take a look at the old kidney bean pod for example it was a case of that it was the speaker sims that let it down so maybe that's an option for you too man um anyway let's crack on let's see who else we have in the house sacred god slayer is here uh says uh hi tim pj and marcin maybe it's too extreme in into jazz territory but have you tried flat wound strings flat wound strings are killer if you guys haven't done flat wounds you've got to try them at least once right they're really great fun um similarly you may want to try something like a pure nickel string uh it's really good fun too has a similar kind of like flat wound warmth to it but it's not all the way flat wound if that makes sense still has a little bit of but then you know round wound half wounds exist and all that stuff too loads of interesting string types or you could play with strings with a thicker coating for example if you want to get a little bit closer to that flat wound string you might try something like an elixir polyweb um, as opposed to the nano web and the opt web because the poly web has a bit of a darker tone because the coating is thicker and it's also a little bit smoother you get a bit less of that string squeak it's kind of a fun way to get part way towards that flat sound while still having a little bit of that round uh wound kind of like zing in your tone so, uh, very interesting uh who else do we have in the house anyway um oh yeah with regards to the cortex uh we'll talk about that in a minute there's some issues that neural haven't addressed yet um do you know there's been some things brought up in the uh the youtube YouTube sphere uh, about things like the plugin hosting and stuff. Honestly, it's never bothered me. 
Not even one bit. But I understand. I totally hear where you're coming from, man. Uh, who else do we have, anyway? There was some discussion of uh, some injury stuff that I want to get into very, very quickly. But first of all, Larry Warren's here. Hey, Larry. It is great to see you. Uh, David Yates is in the house. David's been suffering with his hands lately. Uh, I'm glad to hear that you're feeling a bit better, man. That's really cool. Uh, hands feel a bit better. Uh, thanks to wearing wrist supports at night. That can be a game changer for Carpal Tunnel, to be fair. Um, just wearing some wrist supports while you sleep. I know people who've had great results from that. So if that's working for you, fantastic fantastic and if it keeps you um you know uh, surgery is very safe and it's definitely an option i'm sure uh this does not constitute medical advice um but you know if there's a non-surgical intervention you can find that works fantastic pleased to hear that very very pleased to hear that uh who else in the house mark crandler's here mark it's great to see you mark's asking about uh lovers of jazz rock or fusion out there uh i love the old brand x and return to forever stuff uh any suggestions on some bands like this would be greatly appreciated we love that stuff too man return to forever are one of those bands that when i first heard them i was definitely not ready for uh keith is in the house keith it's great to see you um cracker tom is uh still in italy in his camper very jealous right the sun is out and you or it was but you know it doesn't match the italian countryside let me tell you um so yeah you know what it is um strat and spark mini are ready to go pleased to hear that we took a look at the spark go this week which is also fantastic hard to pick between the two i feel like for convenience the go is the one but still think the mini has the edge in terms of sound just a little bit because it's bigger so you know there's trade-offs uh say god slayer your turf is unbelievable can concur right fabulous place we love a bit of italy uh who else uh cow cat is here this is good evening i see a lot of gas uh here and there the remedy could be a couple of new cores instead of new pedals hey maybe you know the answer is always always practice um it's very rarely is the answer in gear the answer is almost always in practice but gear is fun and if it helps you play a little bit better then fantastic we like a bit of that uh who else do we have kim is in the house kim it's great to see you hopefully also somewhere sun uh sunny um you know my garden was quite sunny today but not quite sunny in the same scale uh so i'm kind of struggling to find these comments about um about folks uh, injuries and things um well if we can find those we'll start them up because injury risk is something that's very interesting to talk about for sure so anyway listen uh real quick um just want to take a quick minute and remind you guys uh those of you who have so many friends that i haven't checked in with we'll check in those in just a minute but um just want to take a quick second and remind you that of course today's stream is brought to you by elixir strings uh we're going to be discussing some chord substitutions but before we do that i want to show you one of these this is one of the courses that you get as part of um your GI Plus membership. So what you may want to check out, if you're interested in some theory goodness, is Mastering Modes Part 1, which is our comprehensive code uh, course on all things modes playing. When we come back, we're going to be doing a lesson on the subject of chord substitutions. But first, check this out. This is available as part of your GI Plus subscription. <laughs> Modes. What are modes? How do I use them? When do I use them? Well, modes are one of the things that the pros use to add excitement and colour to the guitar parts, and there is no reason why you can't use them too. Now, for some reason, people, especially certain online guitar teachers, love to make modes seem complicated and scary, but I'm here to tell you they really, really aren't. And in fact, if you know the pentatonic scale, I can show you how to play modes with just two extra notes. In this course, I'll show you how to play killer sounding guitar solos using modes without any of the mystery. You'll learn how to play musical sounding solos all across the neck in any key, crucially without sounding like you're just running up and down scales. So, if you're ready to take this next step with me, click the link to find out more.
So that's a little look at Mastery Modes Part 1, available as part of your GI Plus uh, subscription. You want to get into the modes thing, that is the place to go and do it. Incidentally, by the way, the chord that I'm playing on that photograph is an actual chord. That is the Aldemiola B6. If I can play it on this guitar, let's try. I'll turn the mute pedal off. It's going to sound like this. Oh, God heavens. Mm. Not the easiest way to play B6, but you know, B6 is a very awkward chord to play close voiced on the electric guitar. Other ways to play it, I'm sure. So anyway, listen, let's get into the meat of today's session. But before we do, just want to take a minute and express uh, my huge respect and admiration to uh, Timothy Appling. Just read the story. Uh, I find that absolutely unbelievable, man. That is, that is just wild. And I'm so glad that you're here with us today playing the guitar. Couldn't be happier to have you on board, man. So, we'll, you guys read in the comments, man. It's it's something. Blimey. So, anyway, listen, right? Let's get into the meat of today's session. So, we're going to take a look at some very common chord progressions. We're going to take a look at some substitutions that we can make to those chord progressions to make it a little more interesting, okay? So, let's start with one of the most common chord progressions that we're ever likely to come across, which is going to be the good old-fashioned uh, C, G, A minor, F. The No Woman No Cry chord progression. You can think about it as whatever song you want. It can be the uh, With or Without You chord progression. There's loads of them. We call them the four chords of the apocalypse uh, here at GI Towers. Axis of Awesome have done a fantastic version of this with the four chords. You've all seen it a million times, right? Very quickly though, let's just throw some drums on and let's play through some chords together. We're gonna go to the close-up cam. So if you have your guitars, if you don't have your guitars, go get them, right? But you'll need guitars for this. Just gonna very quickly move this slightly this way. That's a little bit better. So let's begin with our C. We have C. We have G next. A minor to follow. And then F. Piece of cake, right? This is literally chord progression one. We've all written songs with this chord progression in mind. Now, we can do all sorts of things to make this more interesting. Like we can change the harmonic rhythm. Like that, where we change the length of the chords, etc. But, you know, it's not really what we're here to talk about. We want some different chords out of this. So let's first of all establish what those chords are and where they come from. So each one of these chords is broadly speaking contained within the key of C major. Now C major is a key that contains, <laughs> didn't Marvin Gaye write the Marvin Gaye wrote everything um, at this point. I feel like Marvin Gaye uh, wrote Cliffs of Dover, um, probably wrote, um, you know, uh, it probably wrote So What uh, and all sorts, who knows, um, most of Beethoven's work, um, etc. Anyway, yeah, I think Marvin Gaye may have wrote this, who knows. Um, so anyway, if you want to get a little bit closer to Martin, Marvin Gaye, then hey, you know, maybe that's the thing. We have an explosion from the battery in my guitar. Is he going to do it again? No, apparently not. So anyway, all of these chords come from a single key that we would refer to as the key of C. Now C C major, at least, contains all of the notes that have neither sharps nor flats. So we might think about it as the following. These are the notes that are available to us. We have C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and C. Now, each one of those notes is represented, sorry, rather, each one of these chords is represented within that scale. So if we take a look at the notes that constitute our C, major chord, we have a C, we have an E, we have a G. Each one of those is represented within our C major scale. It starts on note number one of our C major scale, so we would call this chord number one. G, over here, contains a G, a B, and a D, also represented within our C major scale. Our A minor contains an A, a C, and an E, also represented, you guessed it, in our C major scale. And lastly, F, 
also contains, yeah, you guessed it, F, A, C, contained, represented within our C major scale. So the point with this is when we're constructing chords uh, in this chord progression, what we're actually doing is we're taking three notes at a time from our C major scale and kind of choosing those. And this is what we refer to as uh, a diatonic chord progression. So diatonic chord progression is where we use only the notes from a given scale. We don't veer outside of it at any point. But there are other chords that are available to us within our C major scale. So let's start by taking a look at our C very quickly. This is the first and most obvious place we can begin, right? So if we take a look at just notes that contain three notes, uh, sorry, chords that contain three notes. If we have a C, we could choose theoretically any other two notes from our C major scale, but there are some that are gonna sound fantastic, some that are gonna sound a little less fantastic. Let's start by taking C, E, and G, and let's move some of the notes around and see what we get. So if we start with our C, and we take the E, we can move that down to a D, or up to an F. But we can get some interesting results out of that. So if we start with the idea of taking our C and moving it, sorry, taking our, our E note from our C and moving it down to a D, we get this wonderful crunchy sounding chord over here, which is a big wide open sounding chord that we refer to as C sus two. Now, if we only changed our first chord in our progression, to C sus2 already, we have a slightly different sound, even though it's basically the same. We have a slightly different sound to our previous chord progression, which sounds like this. Let's throw our drums on. So if we had C, G, A minor, F, then C sus2, already it sounds more interesting. C sus2, G, a minor, F. Now, we're throwing some other stuff in there in just a second, but we've taken our chord progression by changing just one chord, we've made it sound more interesting. Now, this is something that we can employ in our soloing too, that we'll talk about in a minute. Now, let's keep that going just a little bit further. So let's see if there are other chords that we can turn into a C sus2, or into a sus2, out of our collection that we've got down here. So very quickly, if we take a look at our G, Let's see what it would take to turn that into a sus2. So our G, we have G, B, and D. Well, what we did in our C chord is we took this note here, which was the third note of our scale, but it was the second note in our chord. We'd refer to this as the third of the chord, and we substituted it out for the next note down in the scale. And here we got, our sus2. We took this E and turned it down to a D. In G, the third of this chord is B. So we need to be able to move that down a tone to be able to turn it into a sus2. Can we do that? Well, that would give us an A. And already, that sounds quite cool. So let's get the drums back on. Let's try our C, our G sus2, and then our other chords as stands. sounds more interesting. Now, we can use this sus2 business to create some really interesting arpeggio lines when we come to play some solo lines over the top of this, which we'll talk about in a second. But realistically, what we continue doing with this is we could continue doing these sus2s with all of our chords. So we could play C sus2, G sus2, we could play A sus2, and then F sus2 over here. Now this hasn't actually changed the function of any of these chords. These chords are exactly the same as far as their function goes. We were playing a chord progression that would read as one, five, six, four. We've turned it into one, five, six, four. But it sounds 
different. It sounds more open and more spacious. Now, sus2 chords have a very open and spacious kind of sound to them. There is another chord that we can play that is another suspension, which will be a sus4. Now, sus4s are quite interesting in of themselves because a sus2 and a sus4, depending upon which direction you look at it at, have you seen that diagram of two guys uh, looking at a road and there's a six or it might be a nine written on the road and they're looking at it from different sides and they're arguing over whether it's a six or a nine. Sus2 chords are kind of like this, right? So sus2, sus4 chord. This chord I'm playing here, right here, that is a G sus2 chord, but it could just as easily be a D sus4 chord. We'll get into why in just a minute, but either way, we can leverage this to make some more interesting chord progressions. Uh, Finball Wizard, sus4 heaven, uh, for sure. Now, you know what it is? It's really interesting to hear all of these kind of chord progressions. Uh, all these chords and the songs that you guys associate it with, but yeah, for sure, Pinball Wizard, big sus fours. Uh, Summer of '69. All those kind of like little respects. All these kind of like kind of like classic songs that have this movement in them. Uh, we hear that all the time as sort of an ornamentation of existing chord. But if we if we are like deliberate about this and we go, okay, this chord is now a sus four, a sus two, or a sus four, uh, we can get some interesting harmonic implications. So let's play with the idea of making some more of our chords sus fours rather than sus two. So let's take a look at how we might take our G chord. Oh yeah, crazy little thing called love, says Daryl Queen. 100%. Yeah, another great song with sus4s in it. So, uh, by a Queen song by Daryl Queen. Who knew? Um, so anyway, very quickly, I'm going to show you this, right? This is an example of this kind of like, uh, is it one thing, is it another? Here is our C sus2. Let's play this together. We're going to play it on fret 3 on the A string, 4, sorry, fret 3 on the A string, 5 and then 5 on the D string and the G string then three, and then three on the highest two strings. Right, keep that in mind. If I take my, my G chord, which is here, which is five on the D string, four, and then three, three. If I take that, and then I take this third, and then move it up to a four, well, now I've got fret five, fret five, fret four, fret three, fret three. That's G sus two, sorry, G sus four. It's also C sus two. So I could play this, uh, which might be quite interesting or it might sound terrible, who knows? So if we play C sus two, G sus four, that's quite interesting. There's an A version with the same things going on. We'll talk more about that in a minute. There's something fun for F on the bottom, but already we've turned this. Into this. Now that sounds to me really very attractive really very attractive indeed so sus2 sus4s they're very cool as far as using them for soloing ideas you can do that with uh relative impunity and what i would say with this is um you can basically build a sus2 or a sus4 chord we'll stick with sus2s because they're basically the same thing um a minor six says marcy not quite it's an uh it's an a minor 11 that we'll get to in a second uh, Sonia into Sting, he says. Yeah, mate, thanks, man. I appreciate that. I'll take it. We love a bit of Sting over here at GI Towers. He's a local boy as well. Um, although where the accent went, nobody knows. Anyway, <laughs> so anyway, um, Sting's accent aside. It's a great name for a band, though, isn't it? I'm going to call a band Sting's accent. Um, and then hopefully I never have to explain it to him because he's very rich and I'm unlikely to meet him again. Uh, met him before, though. He was a nice guy. So anyway, um... What was it talking about? Oh yeah, so soloing stuff, right? So real quick, if we take the idea of let me just throw up my looper here because I've got a I've got a looper uh, on my pedal board. So I'm using the Fishman pedals again. So if I go one, I've never 
successfully done a loop with my hands before, but there we go, right? I could take sus twos. That's quite a nice loop, actually. I could take sus twos from any chord. comes from. So we're in C major, there's my nice little loop, sounds pretty fun, I like that a lot. Uh, the chords that'll tolerate it, in this case, would be C, D, F, G, and A. So well, let's just get rid of the loop. I may bring that back at some point. Um, I'm pleased with myself that I managed to carry that off. Loop pedals are kind of a nemesis of mine. I never managed to do very well with them. But uh, anyway, so that whole business that we're talking about there leads us into something else, which is uh, a little more involved. Now, this is what we're going to refer to as instead of taking a chord and altering it, like we've just done with our sus2, we'll talk about some other examples that you can do with this in a second, but we're going to talk about this kind of chord substitution that will follow along with this, which is what we refer to as common tone substitution. Now, common tone substitution is where we take a chord that is, you know, written into our progression or a chord that we have in mind, and then we find another chord that contains most of the same notes or contains several of the same notes, or maybe contains a top note that is the same. The top note is going to become important as we go forward with this stuff. So real quick, um, let's just get back into that. So a couple of examples of other chord types that we can easily sub in for this. We could easily sub in seventh chords. We could sub in add chords. We could sub in all that sort of stuff. We'll get to that another time, right? Because we're here to talk about substitutions very quickly. So let's take the example of our C chord. And let's take a look at some of the chords that we could substitute our C chord for. So there are several of them, but let's take a look at uh, the notes that are in C. So we have a C, an E, and a G. C, E, G. I'm going to write that on the, uh, the little, uh, little overlay over here. Um, what I want from you guys is I want suggestions of chords that contain these three notes, or two of those notes will be fine. So some chords that contain maybe two of those three notes, right? You have a think and let me know, because we can do all sorts of stuff with this that we'll get to in a second, right? So let me know in the comments chords that you can think of that contain C and E and or G, right? Some combination of those. There are several. Right, so I'll give you an example to begin with. An example to start with might be a chord that contained... Ah, we've got some good ones already. We've got E minor, E minor 7, says Cow Cat. Cool, okay, let's run with those. Rory Lisbon says A7, a very good shout, right? Very good shout. We're thinking outside the box here, right? With the A7 containing... I did it jazzy, says Cow Cat. Uh, e major, mm, we're kind of getting a little bit off the, the, the deep end with that one, but we could possibly make it happen for sure. We've got some other suggestions for A minor. Absolutely, right, totally agree, totally agree. So all of these chords would be, an exam would be examples of um, common tone substitutions for our C. Let's trial them out, right? So let's trial them out. But first of all, let's justify them real quick. A minor seven uh, is a very good shout from Sacred God Slayer because it contains basically all of the same notes, right? So if we take C, E, and G, if I voice them here, there's C, there's with my open E string, and there's G, and then I put an A note on the bass, suddenly my C has become A minor seven. Right, do you guys see that okay? Suddenly my C has turned into A minor seven. How? Because we put this on the bottom. There are other things we can do where we can take this C, E, G, park an F on the bottom, for example. We could park a G on the bottom. 
all of these are producing interesting and different chords. We're going to take a look at some of these in situ, though. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play our chord progression. I'm going to start with my C, E, uh, my C, what am I saying? My C, G, A minor, F. And then on the next pass round, I'm going to sub out the C for a different chord. Steve Ford says C9. That is a very good shout. We're going to say that. We're going to, we're going to throw that in there too. So let's see what effect this has on our chord progression, right? So if we have C, G, A minor, F. Let's do E minor 7 next. E minor, G, A minor. That was really interesting. Let's do that one again. We'll take our E minor seven. Ooh, subbed it in too soon. I said it and I played it. So let's do C. So let's do G, A minor, F, C. Just to get your ears reacclimated to that chord progression, as if you haven't heard it a thousand times. Let's put the E minor seven in here. E minor seven. That's a, that's a really nice substitution is that E minor 7. Had an interesting effect on us um, in terms of both the emotive quality of the chord progression, but also in terms of the um, in terms of the emotive quality of the chord progression, but also in terms of the uh, the way we perceived the tonal center. So we perceived, or at least I did, suddenly perceived a shift towards A minor being the weighty chord that carries all of the, the importance, as opposed to it being a chord that, you know, maybe is just sort of part of the milieu. Suddenly A minor became the one, so to speak. So let's carry on with this, right? Let's do a few more, uh, a few more interesting choices. Let's do uh, Rory Lisbon's suggestion of A7. Very cool chord that moves very, very interestingly through to G. Uh, now this would be an example of uh, a non-diatonic Mm -hmm. a non-diatonic um, common tone substitution in that it doesn't come from a diatonic key. There are other ways you could justify this, but that's what I'm going to refer to it as for this example. Where does this come from? Well, let's talk about it. So what do we have? We have a G, which we can play here. We have an E, which we can play here. So we can play a chord progression thus with an A minor seven, uh, sorry, an A seven to throw in. We're gonna play this one. Here we go. So let's do our C, uh, let's do C, so let's do G, uh, A minor, F. Now that's a really interesting chord because that is begging us to do something else real quick but it does kind of fly so if we go that is crying for us to go here now we'll get into that in just a second but that is leading us in a very interesting direction that we're going to get to right uh, a secondary dominant says Daryl Queen it is a secondary dominant as soon as we do that and that's another secondary dominant as soon as we go here but this is about easy and effective chord substitution so we'll get to that in a minute now uh, let's carry on with this example right let's do some more substitutions so uh, what about if instead of our C let's get as tenuous as we can with this right uh, so Timothy Altman has got some great suggestions uh, what have we have in here E minor F sharp minor B minor I mean let's see if we can make those fly because there's some interesting stuff in there E minor we can definitely do uh, F sharp minor we may struggle with um, but uh, B minor we probably may also struggle with, but let me show you one that is maybe a little out there. So let's see if we can take that. Oh, here's one for you, by the way. Uh, F major seven. So F major seven, if we play an F chord, right? If we play F, A, C, and then we throw the major seven on top, or F major seven, contains two of those notes. If we turn it into an F major nine, 
when we include a G, we get three of those notes. So it becomes a very good sub uh, very good substitution. F minor for that beetle effect. That's a really good shout. Okay, well, let's talk about that F minor thing going on there, because F minor is really interesting and useful too. Now, what about... Ooh, I just got rid of all the branding. That is not what I wanted to do. There we go. That's much better. Um, I wanted to get rid of this instead. Let's take a look at our F chord, right, very quickly. Let's change up what's in our F chord. So here we have F, A, C. Those are the notes that are in our F chord. Uh, save. So our F chord, we could play like this. We could change one of the notes on our F chord to do something interesting, which would be if we took this note here, which is our A note, and we subbed it out for an A flat, which gives us this. Now that is a very emotive sounding chord. It's the Beatles chord I've heard some people refer to as, but uh, Cowcat's referring to the Beatle effect. I always think about it as the John Mayer chord because it's the now I'm sad chord. Take a listen to this, right? So if we play our F, our C, there's our G, there's our A minor, F, F minor. Did you hear us? chord change i fluffed up the resolution but what a great chord change that would be an example uh you know what it is right daryl queen is on the money borrowed from the parallel minor so um you could consider it as borrowed from the parallel minor what i'm thinking about it as is something a little bit different um so i'm kind of thinking about it more as borrowed from a melodic minor uh, a melodic minor scale that I can't agree on the name for because I always refer to it as Aeolian dominance, mixed lady and flat six. But um, so mixed lady flat six and C, uh, the Batman scale, as me and Jonathan Graham always refer to it, which is that kind of move there. Um, but let's do something interesting, right? What I'm thinking about this as, I'm thinking about it taking one of my major chords, one of the chords from my major scale. Now, when you take a note in your pool, if you take a note in your pool of um, notes that you're choosing from and you lower it, you'll know this if you did any of the mastering mode stuff, uh, GI Plus members, you'll understand this. We darken the sound of our scale. So if I take this, for example, very quickly, if I take my C major scale, and then I take my A, and flatten it to an A flat, it becomes a very interesting scale. I've heard it referred to as the harmonic major. We're not too worried about what it's called, to be honest. It's C major with one of the notes flattened. Now, let's do another interesting sub here, right? Let's do an interesting sub for you guys. Watch this. What about our G? What if we took the uh, the G? Well, let's play with this real quick. Let's hide that and let's just change it. So the notes in our G are G, B, D. Uh, and let's maybe play with the idea. It's a very obvious chord that we can play with to substitute for our G. So we could play G, B, D. We could throw an E minor, an E on the bottom, and suddenly it becomes E minor seven, right? So we could play C. Minus seven, A minor, and F. So that E minus seven becomes a perfectly valid substitution for our G. And it still sounds like it's basically the same. So if I play this and then this. We get basically the same result, but check this out, right? What if we took that E minor 7 that we've just substituted for our G, and instead of playing E minor 7, we played E dominant 7? What's the difference? Well, what we've done is we've taken G. And we've sharpened it to G sharp. So now we get this 
beautiful, healthy chord progression. Uh, let me just throw my drums on. Well, we might get something like this. What if we still did F minor of that as well? That's really interesting because it has a lot of movements. Because we're kind of pulling in and out of our tonic scale there and it sounds very very Beatles-ish but here's a very interesting thing notice how notice how that note here oops which is N harmonically G sharp and A flat which means those are two names that you could use for it um, depending upon the context in G7 this note is a G sharp in F minor this note is an A flat but it's the same pitch. What we've done here is in our A minor, we've reproduced this note by lowering a note to get it, which has the effect of darkening the sound of the chord. This, we've raised the note to get it, which has the effect of brightening the sound of our chord. So by introducing the same note, which is this guy here, we, this G sharp, we've both brightened and darkened our chord progression in one move, like this. Watch this. Keep your eyes out for this note. I'll try my best to show you. Uh, I'll try my best to finger it in a way that you can see. So if I go... That interesting isn't that interesting now taking this little step further let's look at the loop going on through that note in there is a little cheeky thing what I could do here for my chords I have C G stuff there but so this stuff doesn't just have to be for your songwriting it can be something that you can use once you get a songwriting is a great way to get grips with this stuff right but it can be a fun way for you to introduce this sort of stuff into your solo playing too so don't feel like this is exclusively a songwriter thing for you shredders out there this is for you so guys listen we're going to go to the q a session but before we do just want to take a quick second and show you this if you want to learn a little bit more harmony there's a very very interesting place you're going to find it this is one of our favorite courses in gi plus this is the uh slide guitar for standard tuning course uh from our friend ian simo friend of gi great guitar player I want to show you this. When we come back, we'll be answering your questions. So drop your questions down below. Let me know uh, if you've got anything that you want me to elaborate on or go a little bit deeper. We'll be doing another session similar to this next week. It won't be quite the same, but similar to this next week. So if you have any questions, I will answer them as best I can. But in the meantime, take a look at this course. This is available as part of your GI Plus membership. Also want to take a quick minute and shout out our sponsors for today, Elixir Strings, who've been kind enough to equip this guitar with a new set of strings, which is why it sounds extra nice today. And why it plays so well today uh took this opportunity to go down a string gauge like i said earlier on from uh 12s down to 11s and man big difference this guitar is absolutely ripping now so anyway listen this is slide guitar for standard tuning when we come back we'll be answering your questions <laughs>
Hi, my name is Ian Simmel and I'd like to share with you my course on slide guitar for standard tuning. This is a 10 part series in which we're going to explore the essential slide hand techniques and pick and hand techniques. We're also going to take a look at rhythm playing with the slide. So we're going to look at how to integrate the slide with major and minor triads. enjoyed putting this series together. It comes complete with some backing tracks for all of the example phrases and exercises so you can practice along and it comes complete with tablature and notation for all the example phrases and exercises. So if you've been interested in getting into slide I highly encourage you to check out this course. It's a 10 part series on slide guitar for standard tuning. So that's my friend Ian Simo with Slide Guitar for Standard Tuning. It's a killer course. I just stole so much stuff from that. Daryl Queen, this guy's tone is butter. I agree, man. Ian's a great, great guitar player. A lovely dude and a very fine teacher as well, you know? So, like, everything's explained really, really well. So if you feel like Slide Guitar is uh, maybe intimidating or whatever, don't be put off, right? If I can do it, I stole so much stuff from Ian, let me tell you. If I can do it, you can do it. So anyway, listen, it's question and answer time. Very quickly, a quick reminder, this stream is brought to you by Elixir Strings. You've been kind enough to equip me with a brand new set of strings for this guitar and also love bringing you lessons. So, hey, good stuff. We like a bit of that. So, um, now... I will quickly highlight on this. The soloing was a bit too quick to catch. I, I'm totally with you. This is something that's going to require more depth. Um, I just wanted to show you that it's possible. Um, so don't feel like, you know, if you missed the soloing thing, you ah, wait a minute, what's that? That's just kind of me giving you a peek under the curtain and going, hey, listen, look, this is something you can do once you master this stuff. It's actually quite easy once you understand the concepts behind these uh, substitutions and stuff to then apply it to your soloing. Um, but it requires a little bit of understanding of that first. However, we've got some questions regarding making a course on this. Um, I think that's possibly something we should do. Um, you know, I'm gonna put it on the list because it's something I'd like to talk about. So we've got a lot of people saying uh, in the comment section they would like, um, they would like course, yeah, uh, I agree. There's a lot to take in one lesson for sure. I would encourage you guys to watch this in the replay as well, by the way. Don't forget these streams are available to catch on YouTube once we've done them, right? They don't go anywhere. They just live on a YouTube channel. So if you're not subscribed to us on YouTube, hit that subscribe icon, you know where you can find us. So I want to show you this, right? This is a question from Hank Staines. Hank's asking uh, anything on the circle of fifths. Uh, I'm going to talk about this very quickly um, and how it kind of works and its relevance uh to us as guitar players i feel like the circle of fifths is positioned as a much more important concept than it actually is and i find it outside of the world of jazz and classical um it's more of a curiosity than anything else um but what essentially the circle of fifths uh is is it's a way of organizing the 12 let's say the 12 major scale um keys that we have in uh in order of scales that are a fifth away from each other. So let's talk about what a fifth is on the guitar. As we look at it, we talk about power chords. So if we have C, we play a power chord, we've got a G. What this tells us is because a power chord contains the notes root fifth, then the note G is a fifth away from the note C. And what this tells us also is that the scale of G major is a fifth away from the scale of C major. Why is this important? Well, 
two major scales that are a fifth away are very close to each other in terms of the notes that are involved. If we take a look at the notes in C major, it's C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. So no sharps flats. In G major, it's G, A, B, C, D, E, F sharp, G. So only one sharp. Out of all the possible sharps we could have played, we only had one. So we've gone from this. That is kind of how our circle fifths works. If we keep going, there's G. Let's go from here. Our fifth away from G is D. Now, every time we move one click further around the circle of fifths towards the sharp side from C to the note of fifth away from that, which is G, there's another G, to the note of fifth away from that, which is D, to a note of fifth away from that, which is A, there's another A, to the note of fifth away from that, which is E, to the note of fifth away from that, which is B, there's another B, to F sharp, etc. Every time we click one click around our circle of fifths, we accrue one additional sharp in our scale. So C major, the first stop on our circle of fifths, has no sharps or flats. We can do flats if we go in the opposite direction. G has one sharp, which is C, uh, which is G, F sharp. That's the one, <laughs> F sharp. Now we keep that F sharp when we go to our next stop off, which is D. D is our next stop off, that's a fifth away from G, so we retain that F sharp, but this time we introduce another sharp, which is C sharp. We may have noticed is these sharps that we're adding are on the seventh of the new scale. So, i.e., the note immediately before the note we've just gone to. So, if we go to D, we add a C sharp. So, C contains no sharps. G is one sharp, and it's F sharp. D is two sharps. It's F sharp, C sharp. And then if we go to A, surprise, surprise, it's three sharps. In this case, it's uh, F sharp, C sharp, and our new sharp, which is G sharp. And these sharps are always in the same place. They're always in the same place. So much so, I saw um, a great story about an old seasoned musician um, back in the day who uh, would signal the key of a piece of music to his bandmates. This is a guy playing the clubs back in the day. Signal the, the key uh, to his bandmates by doing things like this. And things like this. And this. You're like, what the, what does that even mean? What's, what's that? Turns out that meant four sharps, key V. This meant two flats, key B flat. So it's like literally as simple as that. Now, as far as going in the opposite direction with flats, very quickly, let's talk about our first fifth away. If we take C, but instead of playing a fifth up, we play a fifth down. The way we get that is by playing a power chord, but we put the C on the top. We go down a fifth. This gives us F major. And here we accrue one additional flat. And in this case, our new flat is going to be B flat. So we've taken, I don't know why I played a, an E flat there, oh, we're going to get B flat. So instead of this, uh, we get this. Now, interestingly, with this, with our flat, what we're accruing is we flatten the seventh of the key we've just moved away from. So we took C, the seventh of which is B, when we moved to our new key, which is B flat, uh, which is F, we flatten the B, which was the seventh of our previous key. And we keep that B flat when we move to, sorry, when we move to our new key, which is, surprise, surprise, B flat. And then we flatten the seventh of our key of F, which is the one we just moved away from, which gives us E flat and so on and so forth. Uh, I know this is a lot to take in in a 10 minute crash course on the circle of fifths. Uh, sounds like Rick Piano stuff. It kind of does a little bit. Uh, kind of does a wee little bit. But um, hopefully that's been interesting and useful, right? Timothy's got a really great point on this one. Sorry, Darren, you are Timothy. Um, Timothy, I found a. I think that was to do with. Um, oh, wait a minute. We're talking about other stuff. Right. No, we get, we're talking about other stuff. I'm getting cross purposes here. Um, so, a lot's taken in one lesson. That writing it down on paper is huge, right? But with the cycle of fifths, also huge, right? Write it down on a piece of paper, right? Just sit and list it out. Very, very helpful stuff. Um, 
realistically though there are applications of the circle of fifths uh that go way beyond like what we're just talking about which is a musical curiosity um it's a tool for modulating it's a tool for understanding modes and how they intersect um how useful it is for a rock and blues guitar player mm, maybe less so but it's definitely something interesting and worth knowing what i would say is definitely explore this don't feel like it is some kind of like thing where if you don't know how to do it you're a, a, a less of a guitar player anyway guys we're going to conclude that there we're back next week with more of the same um ah here's an interesting one uh next time in the future can you uh address how to build interesting scale runs that don't sound boring certainly well it's a great question right we're going to come back to that for sure but for the time being got a bit you guys do because we've run over even though we extended our stream to cover that uh, little little gaff with the audio at the start but listen thank you so much for joining me my name is nick jennison for guitar interactive gi plus elixir strings have been kind enough to bring you this stream we're back with another acoustic stream next week where we're talking about some more of the same kind of concepts but in some greater depth so what i want you guys to do is if you are getting some use out of what we're doing here a couple of things first of all give us a thumbs up share it with your guitar playing friends all the usual stuff but take this stuff and make some notes on it right and see see what makes sense and what doesn't make sense and come equipped at me with questions Right, so next week, if you've got questions, we can do some questions pretty much from the offset. So if you have questions, let me know. I'll make sure that we definitely have um, we definitely have some opportunity to answer those questions. We'll be talking a little bit about things like transposition as well. So let's get to that in uh, in a little bit. But for the time being, I'm going to play just a wee bit more guitar because I was having so much fun uh, playing over that fantastic C sharp minor backing track, which is available on the Guitar Interactive YouTube channel. Uh, and apparently I have lost somewhere. It's a great track and it's the one I want to play over. Here it is, there it is, in my big list of backing tracks. But listen, thank you so much for having me. My name is Nick Jennison from Guitar Interactive. This stream has been brought to you by Elixir Strings. I will see you next week. Let's play some guitar. My name is Nick Jennison and it's a pleasure to introduce to you GI Plus, the brand new lesson platform brought to you by Guitar Interactive. We've assembled a team of the best players and educators in the world to bring you exclusive lessons covering everything from metal to blues to fusion and everything in between. Want to level up your shred chops? Check out How to Play Fast by Andy James.
Or how about sweet picking with Rick Graham? Or maybe country's more your bag. Well, how about a full-length exclusive country guitar course from Andy Wood? Interested in learning how to play over changes? Well, members get access to hours of exclusive lessons from fusion maestro Tom Quayle. Or maybe you want your playing to sound more soulful. Well, who better than Chris Buck to show you how it's done? Or perhaps you want to learn the secrets of the masters. Well, members get access to over 60 feature-length tech sessions where our tutors painstakingly decode the styles of players like David Gilmore, Eddie Van Halen, John Petrucci, Larry Carlton, Slash, Tosin Abbasi, Paul Gilbert, and many more. You get all this along with exclusive live webinars, free backing tracks, competitions, and so much more. So what are you waiting for? Sign up for GI Plus today.